Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. We're going to pick it up here in a moment in chapter 28, along about verse 20 here. We just, Jacob is on his way to his uncle Laban's uh, to take a wife among our own people instead of marrying one of the Hittite women, um, Canaanite women from where they had settled there, Isaac had settled. And, and he's stopped over in a place and he had a pillow that he used and heaven opened for him. And of course that signifies Christ that would come through this one who's going to establish the 12 patriarchs here very soon as he's on his way to this place. How fascinating it is the way our father touches lives of people he uses. And certainly he had this one. So let's pick it up there if we may as Jacob is moving forward, and he knew this was a holy place because God and the angels spoke to him, or I should say more correctly, the angel of God, and um, showed him these wonderful things. We renewed, uh, or reconfirmed, better said, the covenant made with um, this family. So we pick it up there in verse 20 of chapter 28, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, 21, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. If he keeps his word, I'm going to keep mine. And naturally that was unnecessary, but he said it anyway, 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. And there is that stone, and I, I still say, you know, many people now that we have done more research, we know this is the stone that is called the stone of scone. And certainly uh, how fascinating it is that it was carried with our people where even the kings or queens, where that coronation is put into effect, their first oath is the protector of the faith for Israel. You know, not many people know that, but that is a fact, and we thank our Father for that. Chapter 29, as we continue, verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey, and he came into the land of the people of the east, and that's to say the children of the east, there at... Um, uh, where, where uh, Laban and the others were too. And he looked and behold a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A great stone was upon the well's mouth. Now here, I mean, you know, it's the middle of the day, basically. Sheep should be out grazing. But here they have this custom where they're going to water them all at one time. And evidently this stone was quite huge. And uh, this is their agreement. Water very scarce. And naturally the sheep's waiting for that water. Verse 3. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again into the well's mouth in its place. They, all the, the herdsmen, they accomplished this at one time, the agreement made with them. For, and Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. In other words, it was, uh, this was the family he's looking for. Five, and he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And, and they said, we know him. Verse 6, And he said unto them, Is he well? 
And they said, He is well, and behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And here, I mean, Laban didn't own enough sheep, but that this one little girl could take care of them. I mean, he's not exactly a wealth rich man. But this, this one, uh, one of his younger, uh, little Rachel coming with them at this time, uh, Jacob's heart's going to do a flip-flop here. He's going to see Rachel and fall in love with her, just boom. God arranges things. Verse 7, And he said, Lo, or why? It is yet high day. It, it's early. And neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. What are ye the sheep, and go and feed them? What are you hanging around here for? Uh, uh, Jacob was a pretty good herdsman, as, as we will document before this is over. And what a waste this is. And they said, we cannot, until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. In other words, I guess it would take more than one for them to roll that stone away. And, and then this agreement was so that everybody shared. The water was a precious uh, thing in this area. Verse 9, but it's not something to be foolish about. 9 reads, And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. This kind of lets you know Laban's wealth at this time, not all that hot. Verse 10, And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother, Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled a stone from the well's mouth, he didn't need any help, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. He, he, I mean, he took charge and, and uh, watered them. Eleven, what did he do then? And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. I mean, I'm sure it was with joy. I found her. This is it. This is my wife. This is what I came here for. And I'm sure he fell in love with little old Rachel right there. And, uh, but, of course, naturally, for family, this was custom also. Verse 12. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. Now, in, in the Hebrew language, there's no such thing as nephews and uncles, but, in, but brother means kinsman. And what he was, uh, Laban was his uncle, and he was Laban's nephew. And, and uh, so it was. Verse 13. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. Uh, and he was happy to see him. Laban means white, uh, that the color white. Verse 14, And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. Stayed there 30 days. 15, and Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, it was his nephew, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall thy wages be? What, what, what uh, you're working for me? I mean, he watered those sheep. Poor little old Rachel, could, there's no way she could roll that stone. 16, and Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, which, which means weak-eyed. And, and the name of the younger was Rachel, which means you, like a, a sheep, a lamb. Uh, 17, and Leah was tender-eyed. That means she was weak-eyed. But Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. She was, she was a beautiful woman. 18, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And he made it very clear which one he loved. And uh, this would be the dowry, which was customary. He didn't have anything, but this, would, this is the way he would pay the dowry to have her. 19, and Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. It's a deal. Okay. 
We're going, we're going to swing it that way. Verse 20, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. I mean, he, was, he was, um, definitely loved her. 21, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. That's seven years, this is it. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and, and made a feast. Laban's pretty wealthy by this time. Do you know why? Because of Jacob. Why? God blessed everything that Jacob did. And the sheep had multiplied until he was able to put on quite a feast. 23, and it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. In other words, I'm sure with the party and the celebrating and the veils and everything else, uh, um, he didn't know. 24, and Laban gave unto him his daughter Leah, Zilpah his maid for an handmaid. Uh, Zilpah, uh, I mean, he's trick, trick, tricking him. 25, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah, and he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? That was the agreement. Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And um, certainly um, uh, so it is that uh, Laban was, uh, he, he was kind of subtle in some of his dealings. And he will, he will pass this off in this way, verse 26. And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. And this is a pretense that he uses for his having done this. It's pure out and out trickery. Because uh, Jacob had definitely mentioned, It's Rachel that I love. Verse 27. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also, for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. Laban's cashing in here. Now, you're not going to have to wait seven years to marry Rachel, but go, go this one wedding week, and then you can marry Rachel also, but you owe me seven more years. That's... Um, taking advantage of the lad. What is he going to do? 28, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and she gave, and he gave her, him, Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. He honored his word. Verse 29, and Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah, that's uh, timid or kind of bashful in the Hebrew tongue, his handmaid to be her maid. He, he loved his daughters, and he, he took care of them, gave them each a handmaid. 30, and he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Poor Leah, this is a little unfair to her, 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Um, he uh, saw that she was loved less rather than just hated, probably would be a better translation, 32. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, um, uh, my husband will love me. And Reuben means behold or see a son. Behold a son. 33. And she conceived again. You'll notice they always go in pairs, the patriarchs do. She conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon, which is to say uh, a hearing. God, God hurt her. 34, and she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. 
and Levi, which would be the priest line, of course, means joined. And uh, it's amazing how God works because naturally, through the truth, many people are joined into Almighty God. Verse 35, and she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. In other words, that was it. See, uh, Judah meaning praised. And this would be the king line, naturally. This would be the very lineage through which the Christ child would come. After Almighty God has to dress Judah down a time or two, as we will learn in this great book. So here we see the patriarchs, the very tribes of the house of Israel, and later it will be split, not at this time, but it will be split into the house of Judah and the house of Israel. The house of Israel, which would be the ten northern tribes, would be taken captive 200 years before the tribe of Judah, the house of Judah would be taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar 200 years later. And uh, we'll come to that as we go through. Chapter 30, verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. She, she was grieved. Verse 2. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, Am, am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? In other words, what he's saying is, ask the Father. Don't ask me. Ask the living God. And the verse, um, and then we have, in verse 3, and she said, Behold, my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and, and she shall bear upon my knees, and that I may also have children by her. And in other words, uh, we'll, I'll adopt them. So go in to, to my maid, my father gave me. Verse 4, And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. He, he never seems to argue with this. Okay. Verse 5, And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. 6, And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son, therefore called she his name Dan. And Dan in the Hebrew tongue means judging, and that being his name. Verse 7, And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again. Always go in pairs here and bear Jacob a second son. Eight, and Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed, and she called his name Naphtali, which means my wrestling. Verse nine, and when Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpha, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. Ten, and Zilpha, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. Eleven, and Leah said, A troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. And of course, Gad in the Hebrew tongue means a troop. Twelve, and Zilpha, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. Always in pairs here. Thirteen, and Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. And Asher in the Hebrew tongue means happy. 14. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. And he brought them unto his mother Leah. And then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. Now, mandrakes are kind of a special fruit, so to speak. The, the Arabs call them Satan's apples because 
there there is a bit of a hallucinatory um, side to the mandrake, and though it looks like a part of a man is called why it gets its name, and so it is called. Verse 15, and she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? Question, and wouldest thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. I'll, I'll make a deal with you. I'll see that he lies with you tonight if you'll give me the mandrake. 16, And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him, and said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. He never seemed to object to how things were arranged for him. Verse 17, And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived, and bare Jacob the fifth son. Always in pairs now, this being the fifth. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Ishakar. And Ishakar in the Hebrew tongue, of course, means my, ha my hire. 19, and Leah conceived again, and bare Jacob the sixth son. 20, and Leah said, God hath endued me with a great dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons, and she called his name Zebulon. And Zebulon means dwelling, and, and so it is that Leah would have those six. Verse 21, And afterwards she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah, which means vindication or even judgment, if you would. Uh, uh, 22, And God remembered Rachel. Finally, God hearkened to her and opened her womb. Three, And she conceived and bear a son. And she said, God hath taken away my reproach. 24, And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And here, um, and here with this um, one Joseph, she called him Joseph, meaning adding. It is amazing that this Joseph will be one of, uh, of Jacob's favorites. It, he will be the one that will save the whole tribe, in a sense. He'll be blessed of God. So adding probably is the correct name for him. 25, And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away, that I may go into mine own place and to my country. Now, um, re, re, uh, She's going to have, Rachel is going to have one more son for Jacob. And she will call him Ben-Ani, which is son of my sorrow. He would be born at, um, at Bethlehem, the same place that Christ would be born. Bethlehem, Judah. But unfortunately, the reason she would name him son of my sorrow, Ben-Ani, it's because it would bring about her death. And she died and would she would die in childbirth when they traveled to this place, which is today called Bethlehem, and even at that time was called Bethlehem Judah. But uh, Jacob would change the name from Ben Ani to Benjamin, which is to be translated saying son of my right hand. And, and so it would be. But here, now he's, he's quite wealthy, uh, or he has made Laban quite wealthy. Lots of sheep, goats, and, and, and uh, cattle. And uh, he has his family, and he has fulfilled his time. And he's ready to go. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 26. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served thee, and let me go, 
for thou knowest my service which I have done thee. I made him a rich man. Uh, jo uh, he was a fantastic, uh, Jacob was a fantastic husbandman. He knew how to, but most of all, God blessed him. Everything he touched. Verse 27, And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. I know that all this blessing is because of you. And because what did he have when, when uh, Jacob came there? Well, uh, Rachel could take care of all the sheep. She didn't need any help. And now it took many to tend the flocks, the herds. 28, and he said, appoint me thy wages and I will give it. You, you, just, uh, you, you just ask what you will and, and I'll agree to it. Verse 29, and he said unto him, thou knowest how I have served thee and how thy cattle uh, was with me. You, you know how I took care of them. 30, for it was little which thou hadst before I came. You had hardly anything. And it is now increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. And now, when I shall provide for mine own house also. Um, I, I, I want to take care of them. I want to build a herd for them also. 31, and he said, what shall I give thee? And Jacob said, thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. 32, I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats and of such shall be my hire. I'll take them. I'll always take the speckled and you keep all that is white. And of course that being Laban's name, 33. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come when it shall come for my hire before thy face every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep that shall be counted stolen with me. In other words, if I claim any of them uh, that is white, all white, it means I would have stolen, and I'm not about to. I'm not about to steal any. Those are your part. Verse 34, And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. I won't agree to it. We'll just do it that way. In the future, all you'll have is the speckled and the spotted, and I'll keep the pure white. Well, naturally, you know, Laban's pretty sharp. Nor naturally, most sheep would be pure white. Verse 35, and he removed that day the he goats that were ring straight and spotted and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had some white in it and all the brown among the sheep and gave them into the hand of his sons. Old Laban said, you, you get them out of here. And he, he knew that as long as the he goats that were spotted were there, there were going to be more spotted cattle. So he's crooked. I mean, he really is trying to take advantage of the situation. 36. And he set three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. In other words, um, uh, he, he moved them far enough away that the street that would have been Laban's couldn't mix. 37. Here you have some of the first animal husbandry uh, of the practice of selective um, breeding in God's Word. Listen to it. 37. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and tilled uh, white stakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. He sharpened them okay, and drove them. And um, verse 38, And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs 
when the flocks came to drink, that they could conceive when they came to drink. Now, you'll, you'll have a lot of people that will say, well, it was the popular, or it was the, it was the chestnut tree. That had nothing to do with it. All he did was built a fence whereby he could separate, uh, make it a chute, if you would, and on the way to the watering trough. And what will happen is, he will, as you're going to find out here, he'll put a speckled he-goat or a speckled he-ram at the end of the chute, and when an animal comes in heat, regardless of what color it is, it's going down that chute and where he's got the, he's got it all laid out here. The wood had nothing to do with it. It was the fence and his own separating when when a ewe came in heat, it went to the speckled he goat or he ram. Okay. And naturally, what are the offspring going to be? They're mostly going to be speckled. Meaning what? They belong to Jacob. It's it's pretty sharp deal, okay? But the type of wood has nothing to do with it other than the fence. 39. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring straight speckled and spotted. Why? Verse 40, And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring stake and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. I mean, he's separating them. He's taken his own animals and separated them out of there. And naturally, he's, he's doing quite well, doing quite well. Verse 41, And it came to pass, uh, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. In other words, he only picked the healthiest and the strongest, the best formed and uh, sent them down the chute he wanted them to go. 42, and when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in, so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. One of, some of the first animal husbandry and poor old, uh, poor old Laban getting uh, his one more verse to complete. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men servants and camels and asses. Why? Well, because of his, his animal husbandry and the way that he managed things. And Laban, trying to shortchange him, ended up getting quite shortchanged himself. So, uh, this, is there anything wrong with that? Well, not really. It, um, uh, it, is, uh, it was fair and square. The agreement was made that that's how it would be, that it would be left in Jacob's hands, and boy, he took care of business. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it, won't you? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge, that's our Father. You do have the right to spiritually discern 
who you should listen to, who you should study with, who you should fellowship with. Use it. It's a gift from God. And uh, how precious it is. You that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And uh, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. And uh, we just, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need the number and you don't need an address. And certainly our prayers go out to the to those in Japan uh, which are suffering greatly at this time and we just ask our Father to to bless. So let's go to his throne if we may. And um, you know, Father loves you. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Why? Because he, he wanted you're unique and he wanted someone just like you. So but he does want you to love him. That's what he wants from you. Let him know that today. Won't you, Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and that being a comfort to everyone everywhere and um, those even on a mission. Richard from Texas. When all the souls from the first earth age have been born in the flesh, will this trigger the sixth trump? That's exactly what it is. When all the souls of God's children are born of woman, then comes the end. Um, Jim from um, Ohio, where in this, where is the scripture that woman shall not wear anything that belongs to man, and what does it mean? You're thinking of Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. What it means is this that a woman or a man shall not take, a woman shall never take the place of a man in, a, in, um, in sexual activity. It means the same thing for a man. A man will not wear women's clothing. That is to take the place of a woman. That's what it means. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Uh, Annie from uh, Indiana, if different people read the Bible, they could uh, all get a different meaning for it. What is the best? Let's see, I, I have been studying with you for about three years. Sometimes my friends ask me questions. This is a question I get a lot. If different people read the Bible, they all, could all get different meanings from it. Well, you know, a scholar of the Word will always go to the original manuscripts and confirm what he is teaching to know it for a fact. So, and if more people would do this, and this is why I recommend the simple Strong's Concordance, because whether you're a student of Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, it gives you the word that was utilized in the original manuscripts, whereby you can know and understand whether it's correct or not. Many uh, Greek and Hebrew are fixed languages. English is not so much a fixed language. It changes through various generations, and, uh, and so it is. But uh, they, this is the reason, unfortunately, many times it's because of ignorance that they get some, the wrong answer. Pat from Texas. You speak of the first and second ages. I don't understand what you mean. Please explain. Well, there are, if you've ever read the second book of Peter in chapter 3, you know there are three earth ages and there are three heaven ages. There was the first earth age, which God destroyed when Satan rebelled. We're in the second. And um, Father is going to destroy everything that is wicked on this earth and replenish it and take us into the eternity, which is the third earth age, which is eternity to the end of um, infinity. There has no end. Diana from Maryland. What book would give meanings of names like Arnold and so forth? Well, I, I, the um, Smith's Bible Dictionary will give you the definition of the names utilized in the manuscripts, okay? Or that is to say the Bible, all right? Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't think Arnold is in, you would find it. It means the high-flying eagle is what it means in the Hebrew tongue. 
but uh, it would give you a big boost to it. The, the, we have it in our library, and the one that we have in our library also gives you the definition of the names utilized in the Word of God, basically. Uh, Cass from uh, North Carolina, Pastor Murray, thank you so much for your, you're welcome. May God continue to thank you. Would you please explain the procedures for planting a fleece out uh, at night and learn if a thing is God's will for you. Does I, it have to be fleece? Would would any cloth do? Well, I, I, that's you know that's what um, uh, in one place in the Bible that that happened with Gideon. But uh, I, you you don't want to do that. You need this is what you do. You plan a certain thing that you want to do. And you, first time, you go for it. If it fails, you think about it. You take the reason it failed and fix it. God doesn't particularly care for a quitter. So fix the part that failed and pray about it and ask the Father's blessings and go for it again. If it fails this time, that's twice, then Again, look, why did it fail? Fix that. Now, this time is where you put the fleece, so to speak. You know, uh, like again, Father doesn't, uh, he won't, he doesn't like a quitter. So put it together, pray about it, and this time tell the Father, this time, if it doesn't work, I'll get the message. I'll know you don't want me to go that particular route or way. Try it that third time, and if it fails, you better start all over on a different direction because it's not, it's not God's will. That's about the best way you can put a fleece out today, and it uh, helps you in building and in planning, and um, it keeps you in touch with God. Janice from Mississippi, Pastor Murray, can you please explain the Holy Spirit? It's real easy to explain the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit. His is the only spirit that is holy. And naturally, you might say, well, how does Christ fit into this? Well, Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So it's Christ's spirit also. Why? Because they're the same spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. Uh, Melissa, from, Melissa from Michigan. I am on prescription pain meds and have been for four years. Is it okay to take this drug if it is prescribed by a doctor? Okay, when, when I said the other day where someone asked about a husband using drugs, and I said, well, the, that is explained in the Bible as sorcery. Because sorcery, the, the Greek word in, from, let's say, from the book of Revelation, Chapter 21 states that in heaven there's not going to be any sorcerers. The word in the Greek is pharmaceutica, which our word pharmacist comes, means a druggie. They're not going to make it. Okay, They're just not going to be there. Now, that has nothing to do with medications. Luke was a medical doctor. He was a physician. And with God's approval, naturally, because he wrote the book of Luke. He, he did most of the scribe work for Paul. You can always tell because he, his thumbprint is on his writings because he uses medical terms. And a scholar can pick up on Luke just bam, that quick. So, so God approved of it. But naturally, we, we have medications, and um, uh, some of them good, and some of them maybe not so good. But uh, they are, when doctor prescribed, there's, that's not sorcery. You might look at it in this way. Sorcery is where someone wants to find a high with using something other than the Holy Spirit, not for medication or any other thing other than finding a high or a religious experience util utilizing drugs. Wouldn't even necessarily have to be a religious, just an experience. Feeling good when they're killing themselves. B burning their brains, cooking their brains, and to where they they are worthless. 
that's why they won't be in heaven. That's what a sorcerer is. It has nothing to do with proper medication. Uh, Jennifer from um, Jennifer is from Wisconsin. My name is Jennifer. I am 10 years old. I'm from Wisconsin. My question is, why did they have to beat and spit and crucify the Lord Jesus? Oh, that, that's a good question. He, because uh, he, he paid that price on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of sins. He was the perfect sacrifice. At the same time, we can learn from that. Um, and I want you to make a note of Hebrews chapter 2. And I want you to read it real carefully because it tells you why Christ died on that cross. It was, you'll find it in the 14th verse of chapter 2, the great book of Hebrews, 12 through 14. It was to destroy the devil, which death rather, which is to say the devil, to get it off of our backs, to change it for one and all times, and to forgive our sins. But at the same time, Emmanuel, God with us, to show us that if he wanted us to be born in the flesh, that he himself showed us how to really do it upright, because he also was the only begotten born in the flesh, okay? It's good to hear from you. Nice question. Um, this would be Lou from Texas. Oh, are the... Are Christians, or I'll say members of the chapel, are get forgiven by our Heavenly Father for the wrongs or bad things we did in our lives prior to receiving the truth? That we were taught from very early ages from other religious organizations that we now see were not truth. But does God have mercy and forgiveness now? It, of course it applies. And it applies to everyone. Once you repent, it's erased from the book of life. The book of life is where our record is kept. That's where your church letter is. It's in heaven. It's not in some church building here on earth. It's in heaven. And when you repent and you mean it from the heart, then certainly it is erased. And, and you have a clean place there in heaven where nothing is written against you. And certainly uh, all you have to do is to let him know you've had a change of heart, a change of mind, you regret what happened, and you're, you're as best you can, you hope it doesn't happen again. And the reason you don't forget, though it is, is so that you don't do it again. But God says to you, once you bring it up and ask me for forgiveness, then I don't want to hear about it again. Because when you, if you bring it up to him a second time after he's forgiven you, you're not questioning yourself. You're questioning God as to whether he had the authority to forgive you or not. He doesn't, he, he doesn't like that too much. So once, once you repent and once you ask for forgiveness, he says, I don't want to hear about it again. It's gone. It never happened. <clears throat> okay, uh, this would be William from California. I am, uh, and I also I am looking for the Bible passage that refers to God being like a huge evergreen tree. I think I remember the pastor referring some, some like that when speaking of the symbol of the Christmas tree. Well, it's Hosea chapter fourteen, verse eight. Uh, God says, "I am a." great fir tree, meaning, uh, and, and it's symbolism, it's symbolic that God is a great fir tree. Why? It's evergreen, which means it's ever living. It doesn't, once a year, the old leaves get frostbitten, whoop, they're gone, blowing around, and, and the tree is naked. No, it, it, uh, his, his is evergreen, meaning eternal life through him. Uh, that's what the symbology is, and that's why you don't want to let somebody rob you in thinking trees are bad, because he even refers to us as his planting trees of his harvest, and he considers himself a tree. Denny from Louisiana, I think it is, will the Christians go through the first part of the tribulation? Well, 
who do you think it is that God says when the Antichrist appears, you're to be delivered up and the Holy Spirit is going to speak through you? It has to be a Christian. It's not going to be some non-believer. The Holy Spirit is not going to want to speak through a non-believer. It's those that have are God's elect, chosen before the foundations of this earth, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. People that know Satan, they stood against him in the first earth age when they were chosen, and they're going to stand against him again. They were chosen in the first earth age, but they will be in the last generation, meaning in fulfilling the prophecy, the first shall be last, because they are here to stand against Satan when he comes as the false messiah. And boy, will they do a good job. They will allow Father to speak through them. You can read it, Danny, in, in, Revelation, I mean, in Mark chapter 13, detail by detail. In that hour of temptation, we don't find Satan tempting. We find him to be an abomination. And the Holy Spirit will speak through us. It won't be you speaking. It will be God speaking through you to condemn what is happening in the world at that time. Okay, Esther from California. Where was the six-day creation people when Noah's ark left and the earth was flooded? Were all the people killed? No. Uh, go back and I, I want you to read... Um, uh, Genesis chapter 6, all over again. Read it again and again if you have to. But come to the verse where Noah, who was, who did God tell Noah to take aboard the ark so they were saved? Two of every flesh. Now let that settle in your mind. He was told by God, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Naturally, God had made man flesh, and the six-day creation were flesh. So he took two, that's male and female, of each, each peoples and put them aboard the ark, besides the Adamic people that um, were uh, Noah's family through which the Christ child would come. That's why God saved them even on the ark so that their offspring would have the opportunity to love the Lord Jesus Christ and find salvation without the interference of Satan and the hybrids, that is to say the fallen angels that came to earth and tried to mess up God's overall plan of salvation. Uh, Naomi from Arkansas, my question, how was, how was the first earth age destroyed? I've heard by a flood, not Noah's, and I've heard uh, by the Ice Age. Well, it was, it was, it is known as the Katibo. If you have a companion Bible, Appendix 146 gives you the layout, scripturally, how it happened. Now, this is why that I recommend that people visit the Ash Falls, Nebraska State Park. Because right here in the middle of America, we have artifacts that are all African. You have rhinoceroses, camels, all five different types of camels, birds from Africa. How did they get here? It was before the plate split. When the Catabo happened, if, if you take the United States of America and the African continent and push them up together, they just about fit. Why? Because those plates were together at one time. And God split those plates. And certainly those plates and their shifting today, which we just experienced in the, around the ring of fire in Japan, uh, which is, is a tremendous uh, earth-shaking move. Father, uh, he warns us in, in, uh, in the 13th chapter of the great book of Mark, in the end times, you're going to have many earthquakes. Uh, we're having them. And if a watchman had better be awake and watching, because things are happening right before our very eyes, and I wonder if everybody's awake. I don't know. We'll find out, won't we? Bill from Ohio, besides Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6, 
Does it say anywhere else in the Bible that when we die, we go straight to heaven? Yes, it does. In many places. Probably one of the best places in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. To be absent from this flesh body, dead, is to be with the Father. Instantly, just like that. You, you are there. And, and also, in, in uh, St. John chapter 8, where Jesus says, I, I knew, um, uh, I, I was there uh, co concerning Melchizedek, Abraham. I knew him. Well, because he came there before Abraham as Melchizedek. And then he makes the statement in the closing verses of chapter 8, St. John, uh, that God is not the God of dead, but of the living. Even, even Satan is still alive. Even the fallen angels are still alive. But they're where God wants them, in uh, people uh, in paradise, and of course the fallen angels are in uh, uh, holding to, for the day they will be exterminated, as it is written in Revelation chapter 11. And so it is, and we're out of time again. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it's the letter He has sent to you explaining why things are as they are. And when you study that letter chapter by chapter and verse by verse, it makes His day. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. Why? He loves you. And that's why he sent you the letter. Now, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, and only if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me, listen good now. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day. Why? Because Jesus, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them.
Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you, God bless you, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, you know what, we're going to just visit a while here through this week, do some specials, talk about perhaps some special things. I'll talk to you perhaps tonight, maybe even again tomorrow night, about law versus grace. That's not really a fair statement, but I'm going to make it anyway, and when we're finished, you'll understand.